Good morning. Uh, on behalf of the East Georgia State College Convocation Committee, I'd like to thank you all for being here this morning. My name is Carmen Palumbo. I'm the Dean of the School of Humanities. It's also my privilege to serve with Dr. Lee Cheek as co-chair of the annual academic convocation. This event will be just a, one of many during the academic year dealing with the theme of civility. Those of you who are here on Tuesday for Dr. Bomer's State of the College Address saw it addressed in that setting. Uh, I hope you'll join me uh, throughout the, join us throughout the year as the college community explores this theme. In keeping with that theme, I hope everyone will take a moment to quiet their electronic devices. I hope too that you will join me in welcoming to the stage someone who really needs no introduction. Uh, he's the person who created the tradition of the annual academic convocation at East Georgia State College with the idea that we would have one event at the beginning of the academic year to establish a theme to be explored throughout the year. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Robert Bomer, president of East Georgia State College. Good morning, East Georgia State College. Welcome to East Georgia State College's annual convocation. Uh, as Dr. Palumbo just told you, uh, holding a convocation early during a fall semester uh, is a tradition at many colleges and universities across the country. And the purpose of it is to welcome the new members of our community. It's also to celebrate the beginning of our new academic year and then to focus on a theme that's really important to our academic community. And I want to thank all of you for taking your time to participate in the continuation of this really important tradition. Now, the theme, as you all know, for our convocation is civility. And we talked about that a lot on Tuesday of this week. And I just want to remind you that we chose civility as our theme because building civility is really essential to maintaining a culture of respect at East Georgia State College. We take a really deep pride in having a culture where we treat every member of this community with respect for their unique position, regardless of the position they hold, regardless of their power, their race, color, religion, their socioeconomic status. Simply put, a culture of respect defines who we are as a community at East Georgia State College. So I extend my deep appreciation to Dean Cheek and all the members of the Culture of Respect Task Force who work so hard to remind us of this continually. And I want to thank Dean Palumbo and Dean Cheek and all of the members of their group who planned today's convocation and especially to our keynote speaker who's going to be introduced to you shortly, who's going to help us understand this concept of civility in a much more, uh, a much deeper manner. So thank you again and welcome to the start of our uh, fall semester. And at this time, I'd like to call our Vice President for Academic Affairs Dr. Vest to the stage to uh, lead us all in the Bobcat Pledge. Please welcome Dr. Vest as she comes to the stage. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. So wonderful to see you here with us. Uh, many of you I saw during the orientations and registration sessions this summer, but 
This is really one of the first official events in your career here with us as Bobcats. This convocation and induction ceremony celebrate the transition that is taking place in your lives at this very moment. It's one of the biggest transitions in your life where you move from high school uh, into the college level. And because of your prior achievements, you have reached a personal and educational milestone. It's time now for you to join with generations of East Coast Georgia State College students who came before you to this campus in the pursuit of knowledge, discerning judgment, and responsible action. I'd like to call down uh, Professor David Strickland to the front. He'll lead you in the recitation of the Bobcat Pledge and would all the students now stand. You have earned a place in a community where learning and service is our purpose and the ideals expressed in the Bobcat Pledge are our guidepost. Welcome to the community of scholars. I'd like to introduce now Dr. H. Lee Cheek, who is Dean of Social Sciences. Hello friends and welcome to the convocation. This is something that has been planned for you for a very long time because we care about you and we care about this community. I have the great privilege of introducing our speaker, uh, Professor Dan Buccino. Professor Buccino is a professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, Maryland. As most of us know, this is one of the great institutions of higher learning in the world, especially when it comes to the fields that uh, Professor Buccino represents. He's also the director of the Johns Hopkins Civility Initiative, which was in many ways a model and an inspiration for our work here at East Georgia State College. He is also the clinical manager of the Johns Hopkins Broadway Center for Addiction. He earned his bachelor's degree and his master's degree from Johns Hopkins, did a, uh, more graduate work at Smith College, and uh, we are very honored to have him here with us all the way from Baltimore to the Wiregrass region of Georgia. Let me introduce Professor Dan Buccino. Let's give him an East Georgia State College welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh boy, I'm very honored and, and uh, moved to be here and after all that introducing I feel like I should probably just say thank you and good night and we can move on but I guess I should try to say a few words about uh, civility. Again, it's a great uh, pleasure and honor to be here and as I said I was very uh, moved by the, by the Bobcat pledge. My um, two daughters just graduated from college this past May and the May before, and um, going through that experience with them made me want to go back and do it all over again and, and get it right. So uh, please enjoy your time. These are really very special, uh, special years and, and an exciting time, and I, I'm sure you will take full advantage of that. So we'll talk uh, briefly about civility. 
uh, today. You know, I uh, love Georgia, but it's not Baltimore. You know, what can I say? It ain't Baltimore, but then, then what is? I do want to talk a little bit about my history uh, in Georgia. Uh, in the late 70s, early 80s, I was a drummer in a punk rock band called the Insect Surfers, and we played down in Georgia a number of times, Athens and Atlanta. Uh, we played with REM, we played with the B-52s, the Psychedelic Furs, you know, all the, all the big names in alternative rock. Uh, the Insect Surfers still exist, uh, and uh, the lead uh, insect there with the blonde hair uh, moved the band to California um, a couple of years ago. Uh, but came back for some East Coast tours last fall, just about a year ago, and the fall, uh, fall before that. He asked me if I would drum with them, and so I got to play with my old band again. It was great fun, and we came to Atlanta, and we were in Athens uh, just about a year ago to the day at the, at the World Famous. So that was my first exposure to Georgia in the late uh, 70s, early 80s, and the beginning of the whole punk rock alternative music scene. I guess I talked about it uh, so much that my father got interested in Georgia. And in 1984, my father became the dean of the College of Education at the University of Georgia, a position he held for about 10 years. I'm wearing his UGA uh, tie um, now. Um, I learned a lot from him about the education system in Georgia, uh, the, 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 the power of land-grant institutions. I learned from him that Georgia has the second most number of counties in the country, as he would always be traveling around to all of the county, uh, county school boards. So he, um, he was at, uh, at Georgia for 10 years. Uh, the interesting thing, another interesting thing about my father is that he was the son of Italian immigrants and a high school dropout. Uh, he really was kind of a, a dead-end kid in uh, Brooklyn, New York. He uh, fortunately or unfortunately got drafted into the Marine Corps uh, during Korea and um, went through the Marines, became an officer there, uh, took advantage of the GI Bill and went back to college at the University of Chicago where they didn't require a high school diploma. Uh, he took some sort of entrance exam, and at the, at the time he, he got in and then went on to get his PhD uh, and become the dean of the College of Education here and was always a, a huge proponent of, of public uh, education. So I, I'm very particularly honored and thrilled to, to, to be back in uh, Georgia. I lived with my parents for one quarter in 1985, and my father and I managed to get our pictures in the UGA Bicentennial yearbook together. Now, I couldn't find the yearbook, so I couldn't show you the pictures, but it's, it's around somewhere, so that was a special time. Meanwhile, my, uh, my mother was also having an interesting time in Athens, Georgia. She was known as the, the Chatelaine of Witherspoon Court. That's where we, uh, they, they lived. And among other things, she was actually REM's first secretary. Uh, her office was in their building, and she typed up some of their first uh, contracts. So she actually has a much bigger and better collection of signed memorabilia than, than, than I do. And she also, I had a number of friends who are still in the music business. She would let uh, bands stay at their house so that, you know, the dean of UGA, I guess it was a bit of a scandal. You know, the dean of education at UGA, his wife was hosting all these punk rock bands, you know, crashing in their, in their house. But um, so Georgia has been a very special time. And we were, this is part of the festival we played in last, uh, last um, uh, uh, September in Atlanta. While we were in Atlanta, I went for the first time to the Ebenezer Baptist Church uh, and to the, the Martin Luther King um, uh, Museum uh, there, and I realized that, in a way, foreshadowed the return here to Georgia to talk about civility, uh, because that was certainly a, a big part of uh, the King and Gandhi's work. I suppose leadership at one time meant muscles, uh, but today it means getting along with, with people. That was certainly reinforced in Atlanta at the, at the King Memorial. Um, and I, I think part of what is at stake with uh, civility is um, you know, coming together in settings like this, you know, auditoriums like this, colleges like this, 
uh, we are all under the same cosmopolitan canopy. Uh, and coming together like this allows us to become a little bit more familiar with people who are different uh, than us and uh, can go a long way um, in uh, easing some of the tensions of life. But if you take nothing away uh, from today's, uh, today's talk, I guess this is the, the message. You know, in Baltimore, we can be a little bit blunt. Uh, but, you know, if, if nothing else, this is really what uh, civility requires. Um, we launched the Civility Initiative in 1997. That's Pierre Massimo Forni in the middle there with uh, one of my heroes, Miss Manners, uh, Judith, Judith Martin. Um, and uh, I think it was uh, it's only at Hopkins could you have a professor of Italian literature, namely Professor Forney and a, and a shrink, myself, you know, walk into a bar and have a, have a civility initiative uh, break out. So we launched it in 97. We had an international conference in 98 to really establish it. And I think one of the things that the Hopkins Civility Initiative has done has really uh, not only put civility on the national agenda, but has, has sustained it uh, for uh, 20 plus, uh, plus years. Lots of places have civility days or civility weeks, but we've tried to keep at it pretty steadily. Uh, being from Hopkins too, we were also interested in doing more than just asserting the need for it, but we wanted to be able to measure it and to be accountable for, for the impact of, of pro-civility policies. We've done some research and advocacy uh, around it um, and have tried to, to spread it uh, around the, the country and around the world. So these are, you know, some of these ideas have been around for 2,000 years, but they're also perpetually uh, renewable. The eternal truths bear uh, repeating. Um, although we've been uh, talking about them for, for 2,000 years, um, you know, each, each generation comes anew to some of these, these issues and, and appreciates the importance of them. And one of the interesting things about civility is that we have found that there's really something in it for everyone. It, it, if, whether it's spiritual or a secular perspective, uh, it's something that's good for business in a very uh, concrete way. It's also good for you in a personal, uh, personal sort of way. Uh, the founding text, which is uh, circulating around here, and Professor Forney appreciates the continued sales, um, is, is his book of Choosing Civility. It literally has sold over a, a million copies and has been uh, very uh, influential. And he followed it up with a couple of other books, The Civility Solution and The Thinking, uh, the Thinking Life, which is uh, what you all are engaging in around here. Um, we also uh, got to talk civility with Steven Tyler from, uh, from Aerosmith. Uh, I'm sharing some of our civility tip cards, and I have to say um, I learned to play drums by listening to Aerosmith. I'd put the Aerosmith records on and I'd drum along, so it was really a dream come true uh, to, to meet Steven Tyler. He's a lovely, lovely guy. Very civil, very friendly, very warm and, uh, and welcoming. Um, and uh, he supported our efforts. We've gone around the country uh, talking about civility, establishing civility initiatives in, in uh, various uh, communities, uh, including Lake Charles, Louisiana, with uh, the uh, inheritor of the Emily Post etiquette book traditions, Peggy Post. We've made presentations in, in all kinds of different organizations, from uh, higher education institutions to uh, elementary schools uh, to Prison. We've done a number of uh, civility uh, conversations in prisons, uh, government agencies, religious organizations. There's been uh, just a widespread interest in the, in the topic. Number of academic, we'll add you all to the list, a number of academic institutions have adopted Choose, uh, Choose Civility as, a, as an important text for their communities. We've been in uh, you know, lots of uh, media appearances, and I guess the highlight of all was in 2008, when uh, Professor Forney made it to Oprah, you know, once you, so he made it to Oprah and then uh, quickly retired and passed the baton on to, on to me. <laughs> now, one of the ways we've been thinking about civility, certainly in the Hopkins medical system, is that, you know, our, our tripartite mission there is teaching, research, and patient care. Uh, but we have really found that civility is the foundation of that academic uh, uh, pyramid. 
and that diversity and engagement, financial performance, and safety and quality also uh, revolve around a good foundation of, of civility. And we've sort of taken to uh, showing this swoosh uh, about how a civil, respectful, and collegial work environment engages employees to form high-performing teams to provide the safest care and, uh, that will drive growth. And the same uh, will be true for you here at East, each Georgia State. Now, uh, civility requires a bit of unpacking and, and defining. I think everybody sort of thinks they know what civility means, but it, it really does uh, require a bit of unpacking, so I'd like to uh, try to define it a little bit. Basically, civility is a form of benevolent awareness. It's about respect, uh, restraint, and consideration. And uh, if we think about ethics as being an obedience to the unenforceable, uh, certainly uh, civility is an ethical practice. Uh, Stephen Carter from Yale has a very nice definition of, of civility, uh, which you know, bas basically in another context, he says that civility is the sum of the many sacrifices uh, we are called to make for the sake of uh, living together. I've long argued that civility is a sacrifice that we make for the sake of our common life. Ben Franklin, if you want to be loved, then love and be lovable, be agreeable. Um, interestingly, civility derives from the Latin word civitas, meaning city, in the sense of civic uh, community. So civility is expressly concerned uh, not just with a city life, not just life in Atlanta, as it were, uh, but how we all are citizens of society and of a, of a, of a community. Civilitas uh, derives from civitas, which means the conduct becoming citizens in good standing, willing to give of themselves for the good of the city, for the good of the family, for the good of the college, for the good of the workplace and the, the like. Now, uh, I gather, just like in Baltimore, some of you in uh, Georgia know a thing or two about incivility and, and, uh, and road rage. Um, I'm surprised to see that Atlanta is the second least courteous. I know Baltimore and Washington are terrible, but it's good to know Atlanta is maybe a little worse. Um, so these are some of, the, some of the kind of common synonyms for civility. It's about politeness and respect, affirmation, tolerance, restraint, um, focus, accountability. Uh, civility also allows you to be assertive. You can be assertive without being uh, uncivil. It doesn't mean just you know, being, a, being a pushover or, or, or a wimp. Um, Miss Manners has a, has a really good uh, definition uh, that requires us to own the change. If you don't like the way things are, and for 2,000 years I think we've been having this idea that things are getting worse, things are getting more uncivil, it's those people from over there who don't know how to behave, if only they could get right, you know, things would be better. So it's been that dynamic for 2,000 years. But what Mitch Manor says is if you don't like the way things are, uh, and to improve the situation, you have to take the leap and realize that you have to behave yourself with a bit of restraint and require your children to do so. Everyone cherishes the idea uh, that you can somehow force someone else and not do it yourself, which would be lovely, but you can't. So civility starts at home. Civility is not about how you feel. It's really about how you make others feel and about how you act uh, towards other people. It's not crude, rude, coarse, or vulgar. Now we know that uh, everything about relationships is knowable. Uh, a lot of these things we learn at the family table. Uh, growing up, my mother used to always say to me, don't act like you ain't been raised. You know, we all get a little bit of this home training, right? But we also learn it in the office, in the workplace. We learn it in the, in the classroom. These sorts of rituals of coming together uh, establish routines and are a way to build uh, trust. Trust allows uh, true intimacy to take place, uh, and civility is at the, at the centerpiece of that. You know, I'm, I'm five and I know better. Uh, some of these things we learn when we're very uh, young. 
So civility, you know, goes back to Aristotle in a way, Aristotle's ethic of right speaking. Civility is not, you know, and this is ironic coming from a shrink. Uh, civility is not about blurting out everything all the time, getting in touch with your feelings and being able to speak freely. Rather, civility is the capacity basically to say the right thing at the right time, in the right way, to the right person. Um, so right, right, it's, it's not, um, you know, the guy down here, hey, I ordered a cheeseburger. That kind of rude uh, coarseness is, is uh, rather un, uncivil. And in fact, failing to control your emotions uh, suggests that you may have a weak character. And it's really uh, nothing, to be, nothing to be proud of. And it's certainly not very civil. So these aspects of, of character we know are the foundations of being a good person. They're also the, the ways to be a good, uh, a good employee. Sort of need to keep in mind that not only is East Georgia State a college, but it's also a, uh, it's also a, a workplace. Uh, if somebody abuses you at work, you always have the option to go home and let it stew in your brain all night. So civility is really the cornerstone of all ethical systems. It's the principle of respect uh, for persons uh, where we treat others as ends in themselves, not as means towards our end. And one of the best ways, I think, to uh, exemplify this is uh, civility is not sort of a fussy kind of exercise in manners and etiquette about which fork do you use or which spoon or how do you set the table. Civility is about an underlying, the underlying wish to be respectful, and one of the best examples of this is, you know, I'm obliged to cover my head in some houses of worship, uh, especially in synagogues. Today is uh, Rosh Hashanah, Lashana Tova to uh, our Jewish uh, community members. So we cover our heads in some houses of worship, but uncover them in other houses of worship. So very different expressions of manners and etiquette, if you will, but both driven by the same underlying wish to be respectful. Um, the civility has something to do with the golden rule. I mean, just about every faith tradition has some variation of the golden rule in Christianity and Matthew uh, and everything due to others as you'd have them do. Uh, to you, for this is the uh, law of the prophets in, in Islam. Not one of you truly believes until he wishes for his brother what he wishes for himself. Uh, church nearby, this week's challenge, forgive someone for your sake, not his. You know, we go on, Judaism, what is hateful to you, do not do to your neighbor. This is the whole of the Torah. All the rest is commentary. Uh, go and learn it. So. Um, do unto you as you would have others do unto you. Toyota's variation on the, on the golden rule. Um, <laughs> Buddhism, treat not others in ways that you yourself would find hurtful. So the golden rule's got, you know, pretty good tradition, right? It's, uh, everyone uh, sort of takes it up. Although uh, part of me thinks that the, the golden rule uh, can be a little bit self-referential in the end. If it's good for me, it's good for you. If it's not good for me, it's not good for you. And I think uh, what civility uh, asks us to do, to kind of move past over that, is actually to live one step beyond the golden rule. To think first of others' comfort and convenience. To think, if it's not okay for other people, maybe I don't want to insist on my right to do it. You know, I, I, I know I can practice my drums out in the backyard um, until a certain time in the evening. But I also know that it really annoys the neighbors, so I generally practice my drums in the, in the basement. You know, I, I could assert my right and privilege to do that, but I, uh, I imagine the neighbors and, and restrain myself. So this is a really uh, key thing in thinking about living one step beyond the golden rule. And George Bernard Shaw said, look, do not do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Their tastes may not be the same. So that's where the golden rule uh, breaks down a little bit. So what we want to do is be kinder than, kinder than necessary. Look, I'm five and I know better. I, you know, everything I learned, I learned in elementary school. Are these just guidelines or are they actual new policies? <laughs> well, in many places they are becoming policies. <laughs> Certainly a lot of workplaces are, are, are taking the, the position about uh, you know, we, we, we really need to enforce certain codes of 
uh, codes of uh, standards, co codes of uh, behavior and standards of behavior. Uh, if we think, and you're going to be talking here at college about what is the good life, uh, and I, I think part of the central to the good life is a capacity to have and sustain relationships. And in order to have and sustain relationships, you need some purposeful poise, you need some relational competence, uh, which uh, civility can, uh, can provide us. Things that are both expedient and polite and both altruistic and self-interested. Uh, uh, we remember that humans are, are social animals. Uh, we emerge out of uh, relationships. And uh, Franklin Roosevelt said, if civilization is to survive, we must cultivate the science of human relationships, the ability of all peoples of all kinds to live together in the same world at peace. Uh, you know, we all know about the fight or flight reflex, but really the tend and befriend instinct in humans is just as uh, innate. Uh, and we want to keep that in mind and pursue, advance our skills in, in um, eliciting more of that. So that all of us can get more of this in our lives at the, at the end of the day, right? And less of this. <laughs> I want less lawsuits and less police and less emergency room physicians. Now, you know, going back to 96, going back 2,000 years and even a few months ago, the polls that we see in the media are fairly consistent. You know, about 90% of the population think that incivility is a serious problem. Uh, large majorities of people think that things are getting uh, worse, uh, things are deteriorating, and yet 90% of us don't think that we are uncivil. We think it's those people who are getting worse and, and more rude. So we have, to, we have to recognize that this has been a problem for a long time. I think it's, it's, uh, it's really on the radar in a big way again recently. I think um, all of the technology, the texting and the internet and all of that stuff has maybe accelerated uh, some of the incivility. I think it has uh, given the illusion of anonymity, which maybe allows us to be a little bit more uncivil. But in many ways, these concerns have been with us for a long time. This is a slide I pulled out from 10 years ago. Um, you know, Congress is, uh, is having, a, uh, one, having a funeral for, uh, for civility. So we keep coming back to these issues. A recent poll, um, you know, just sort of confirming the data that, you know, 84% of us have experienced incivility, 60% uh, of us have quit paying attention to politics because of incivility, 53% uh, stopped buying from a company, 25% uh, have experienced cyberbullying, which, which is a big increase. So the, the data is pretty consistent over the, over the years. Another, inter another interesting uh, survey in um, higher education a survey of chief academic officers, uh, basically finds that uh, faculty are more civil with students in their own institutions than they think they are with students at other institutions. Uh, the provosts think that the faculty uh, is actually less civil with other faculty than they are with students and less civil still with administration. But again, the dynamic is, is very, similar and consistent. We do it well here, uh, but other places don't do it as well as, as, as we do. Um, civility is like a cement in society. It binds it together, and when we lose it, I think we all feel lesser and slightly dirty because of it. Um, certainly, we need to think about working in the multicultural uh, workplace. The American workplace is really the most diverse in the, in the world and labor is our probably most important and perplexing asset. Uh, we have four to five generations at work at the same time, and there's a lot of, uh, a lot of conflict around, uh, around that. Um, this says, um, based for those of you, for you Latin majors, it says, uh, that hang, up, uh, hang up your uh, cell phones. Uh, the cost of, uh, the cost of incivility in the workplace is about $300 billion a year, so it really has a very uh, high, can exact a very high price in terms of absenteeism, lost productivity, uh, turnover uh, of staff, and uh, the use of medical 
um, services and employee assistance uh, services. So the costs are high in the workplace across the board. Where's your section of books that tell you simple things you always, that you already know, right? A lot of this we learned at the, at the, at the, the family table, right? Well, common sense isn't always common practice, Voltaire uh, reminds us. And I want to take a few minutes now to talk about some um, the themes that may be a little bit more specific to the, to the university. There was a very provocative cover story in The Atlantic a couple of years ago, Better Watch What You Say, How the New Political Correctness is Ruining um, Education. Um, and, and, and yet, you know, we're, so we're, we're dealing with what they describe as a sense of vindictive protectiveness, um, people very sensitive to microaggressions, trigger, we have the need for trigger warnings and the like. Um, and really, I, I believe this too, that colleges should equip students to thrive in a world full of words and ideas they cannot control. That's, that's what you're here to do. Uh, and yet, at the same time, I think mainstream culture and, and the academy uh, may need to police itself a bit more the way minority communities have always, uh, always had to. Um, so, the, you know, uh, Carol Christ, the provost of Berkeley, has talked about how free speech has itself become uh, controversial. We're increasingly politically polarized, uh, and universities and colleges sometimes are becoming the, one of the primary uh, symbolic uh, stages for these confrontations. But for those of you uh, uh, starting out in college, I think Carol Chris's advice from Berkeley is actually pretty wise. Ultimately, the safest space is going to be inner, uh, inner resilience. Uh, so navigating that is going to be uh, part of what you work on here. Thomas Jefferson, on founding the University of Virginia, uh, said that this institution will be based on the illimitable freedom of the human mind. For here we are not afraid to follow truth wherever it may lead, nor to tolerate any error so long as reason is left free to combat it. Um, and you know what? What brings us all to higher education, whether we're teachers or researchers or, or students, but fundamentally we're here because we believe in inquiry, we believe in study, we believe in uh, revision, and we have the tenacity to keep coming uh, closer to trying to find some enduring uh, solutions. Um, you know, I think college is really meant to prepare us all to challenge real threats to democracy. There are legitimate issues about legal and economic disenfranchisement. There are racial inequalities. There's political dysfunction and economic crisis. Uh, we need to defend our core principles of humanistic and scientific inquiry. Uh, we need to work as a community uh, and engage uh, critically. Uh, and I think faculty uh, must advocate for principles that sustain the, the learning environment. Universities, colleges are established to debate without anger, respect others' differing opinions about complex questions in order to generate better questions, not simple answers. So you're going to hear that a lot in your uh, college career, that sometimes it's not the answers, it's about asking a good question. Uh, and being tactful. Tact is the art of making a point without making an enemy. And I've always been struck, in fact, by how lawyers can go, uh, can duke it out in the courtroom and then walk out and have lunch with each other like their, uh, like their best friends. When I, whenever I've been involved in any kind of legal proceedings, I don't want anything to do with the other side ever. You know, they're dead to me. But lawyers seem to have a capacity to be particularly uh, tactful. You want to make a point without making an, envy, an enemy. And I think tact in our speech uh, can help us not have to you know, bind ourselves up like this. So just a, a couple of more uh, thoughts. Some of, the, some of the themes in higher education, some of the tensions, is just like with civility and incivility in general, there's really an us you know, versus them kind of thing, generally faculty and student kind of thing. You know, we, we sometimes say that, you know, they, you know, kids these, the students these days don't know how to behave, they don't respect their elder, elders, they have a consumer mentality, they have excess self-esteem, they aren't prepared, they're overexposed to coarse media and always on the internet and the phones. Whereas we, on the faculty side, we can also be unfair 
unhelpful, disillusioned, disengaged, arrogant, and sarcastic. We are not always prepared for you either. Um, so that's part of the work for all of us. I think faculty need to stipulate a fair covenant on the syllabus. We need to be clear on the workload. We shouldn't overpromise. Um, we need to be clear about expectations. Uh, I think students need to be punctual. They need to not be making calls or surfing the internet in class. They need to respect uh, others and come to class prepared. But we also need to be punctual, attentive, fair, uh, all of those kinds of things. When I was, when my daughters were in college, I was very interested in what sort of cell phone and laptop policies their classes uh, cl had, and there was a wide, wide range of different alternatives, you know, um, ranging from losing individual points to whole classes, losing uh, the laptop privilege. But, uh, you know, at the end of the day, some friends of my daughters said, you know, this thing, college costs so much, and you're paying so much to be here. Why waste it? Why not, at, if nothing else, just show up to class and pay attention? You know, you're here, you got to be here. Um, why, why would you want to sleep, sleep through it? So I, I thought that was one of the most persuasive uh, arguments uh, at all. And chances are, if you just show up, <laughs> Your stuff is going to sink in and you're going to do fine on the exams and papers. Um, especially important these days, I think in the university we want to differentiate the trivial from the valuable. You know, the internet makes everything available and, then, and therefore everything appears equally uh, valid. Just because you Google it doesn't mean it's, it's true. So what we have is everything goes and nothing matters. But I think what's really important here is that we learn what makes something valuable that we learn about why it's important to, to learn uh, certain things. And I think uh, all of us find value in classes that question its own value. Um, you know, we should be very careful about uh, alternative facts. We should, um, you know, take minutes to, to, to slow down and sort of uh, question where various pieces of information come, comes from. Uh, the information that you have, the, the truth value, talk about a, take, a, take up a conversation uh, about underlying uh, belief systems and, and, and alternative uh, facts. But, you know, we should be open to double checking our own facts and sources of information uh, as we call on others to be, um, to be careful with their facts as well. Uh, so all of, you know, some of these issues of incivility in the workplace uh, and in the university, the college setting, can lead to bullying and occasionally to, to violence. The University of Mass Massachusetts uh, did a little bit of a survey and found that, uh, you know, 40% experienced bullying in the university, 50% witnessed it, uh, but 50% did not uh, report it. Uh, and it was generally uh, supervisors who were... Um, uh, bullying uh, un underlings. So we want to uh, continue to differentiate the uh, the trivial from the value. We want the valuable. We want to be able to sell our product and ourselves. We want to differentiate knowledge retention, the kinds of things that we do in colleges and re re in universities, from knowledge retrieval, which is what we do on our Google machines. So what's the difference between what we learn and it here and what we get on uh, uh, Google. And I think our faculty strive to be necessary and authoritative uh, mediators. We need a structure of retained uh, knowledge and without a structure of retained knowledge and authoritative mediators and folks who can help us access this, there is no effective thinking. There are no wise choices and there is no good life. Also in the university, I think we should establish a climate of relaxed formality. Um, we, you know, should be careful about using first names, about oversharing, about too much juvenilia, jargon, and the like. Uh, we should, both students and teachers, should restrain ourselves, try to respect each other, uh, because this kind of restraint and respect reinforces learning which then further reinforces respect and restraint and, and consideration. I certainly think in the, in the university sometimes we need to be 
careful when we're playing uh, devil's advocate. These sort of both sides arguments can sometimes be tricky. Um, we need to be sure to listen, to listen to our students. We shouldn't be discounting them. And I know East Georgia State does a really good job at that. I think we need to recognize that the world affects uh, all of us um, and that you know, we should be concerned and stand in solidarity across, uh, across uh, differences. Uh, we need to challenge the stereotypes, like going to colleges for you know, weak and effete people that, you know, real men don't go to college, that kind of stuff. Um, we should talk about how important college and higher education uh, can be. And we should try to es eschew nostalgia. You know, we, we used to do it that way. We should do it. We should still do it that way and be interested in more loftier goals like um, uh, justice and the, and the like. So finally, there's a big consortium of Ivy League professors that uh, um, Gave, came up with some advice for, for students, for their students, and for all students. And basically, the main thing is think for yourself. Think for yourself. Resist the tyranny of public opinion. Uh, you want to develop a sense of open-mindedness, critical thinking, capacity for debate, which is essential to discovering the truth, and which are also the best anecdotes to, uh, to, to bigotry. So finally, what's a leader to do? What's anyone to do in the face of incivility? Well, we want to model good behavior, and certainly I've seen that uh, on display uh, today. We want to ask for feedback. We want to hire for civility. Team interviews are sometimes very helpful for that. You know, I, I know to be on my best behavior with the dean, but I may, ask, I may act disrespectfully with the administrative assistant. She may notice things about me uh, that are very uh, useful to know. We want to teach civility which is what you're going to be doing. We want to create group norms. We want to reward good behavior and call out bad behavior. We certainly want to continue to pay attention to, to, to progress. And I think your president, Bomer, is on the right track here in his establishment uh, a year or so ago of his task force on building a culture of respect here at East, East, East Georgia State. A culture of respect is necessary to the personal, academic, and professional growth of our community. It is one that integrates multiple worldviews and encourages our community to engage in dialogues that value diverse perspectives and foster an atmosphere of courtesy, civility, and respect. You're in the, you're in the right uh, place. Um, Pope John has gotten a bit of a revival through Pope Francis. We want to see everything, turn a blind eye to much, and correct a little. And that goes a long way. We want to behave ourselves. Ultimately, dealing with incivility is a, is a choice. We stay civil not because others always are, but because we are. We choose civility um, when we're smart enough to imagine its rewards. George Bush uh, said, uh, civility is not a tactic or a sentiment. It is the determined choice of trust over cynicism, of community over chaos. So again, imagine you know, we can imagine civility when we're smart enough to work for its rewards. So that's, um, that's about it. I'm uh, raced through, uh, I don't know, 120 slides in 45 minutes, but I really hope we have an opportunity for a few questions and, and answers. Yes, yes, I would hope so. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to open the floor up for your questions. Uh, and if you ask a question, you're going to get a reward. You're going to get a copy of Dr. Uh, Forney's book, uh, just, in, just as a thank you. Okay, so the floor is open. Who'd like to ask the first question? Okay, everybody doesn't need to talk at once. Hang with me, please. Hang on. Questions on Sean this side Smith. of the room? My, got, my microphone. Sean Smith. As a nation, what rule do we need to listen to the most? What rule can help us most right now at the state that we're in? What rule is most helpful? I would say listen. Just listen. Listen and be, be respectful. Oh, that's very nice. That's very civil right there, to ask a question and give it to your seatmate. So yeah, we could all do better. I mean, that's my main job is I'm a psychotherapist and I'm a, I'm a listener. 
Seek first to understand before trying to be understood. Uh, Professor Forney, we had a number of questions sent in in advance of the event uh, through a survey monkey page. Uh, perhaps you could answer this one for us. Uh, I would like to know how the civility initiative began at Johns Hopkins. Um, was there some event that triggered it uh, or a series of related events that initiated the, the, the civility project? Uh, there, there, as I recall, there was not really an event that triggered it, but I was trying to figure out the best way to teach young psychotherapists. And Professor Forney, frankly, was getting a little bit tired of teaching Italian Renaissance literature, and he started thinking more about how do we, how do we make sure our students are good people. He was more interested in in helping students become good people than whether they knew all about Boccaccio and the, and the Decameron. So I think, and then we sort of found each other and sort of kept, uh, kept working on it. But there was not a, at the time, there was not a critical incident. And there's, there's one here too. Hi, my question is this, how can I teach somebody without actually teaching them how to be, teach them civility without having to tell them like, you're not being civil? Does that make sense? Like I'm having, I'm having to deal with a situation where I'm interacting with a person on a regular basis that, you know, has a very ignorant mentality, but I, I feel like it's not my place to tell them, like, you have to change. You see what I'm saying? Well, I mean, I, I suppose it would depend on the person, the situation. Is it, you know, is it a... It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a professor. It's a professor. Yeah. So it's a professor. <laughs> At some other institution, I assume. The mic fell down. Yeah, this is a very important question. I, I, you know, I think the first thing you should, you can try to do is to is to have a conversation. You know, schedule office hours, schedule conversation, and and say, you know, I don't know if you realize, but you know, this the way you have been with me around these issues is a little bit difficult. Um, you know. Yeah. You know, one of my favorite, my favorite uh, ways to deal with incivility, whether it's in a, in a psychotherapy session or in a classroom or in the workplace or whatever, is when somebody says something that's kind of rude or insensitive, is to just be able to say, ouch. Like, you know, you, you, because others bruise as easily as we do. And I think sometimes people aren't aware that, you know, what they think is a, is a clever joke is actually kind of hurtful uh, to us. So just to say, ouch, like, you know, help, help me understand what you meant by that or that didn't. But then I think it's, you know, it's worth scheduling office hours. You know, you want to, it's, it's easier to do this in, in private than in public in a classroom. Schedule office hours and have a conversation. Yeah. Keep up the good work. Dr. Pacino, uh, I think we have time for one more uh, question okay. uh, from uh, Professor McKinney. Thank you so much for your presentation. One of the big buzzwords I'm hearing in education is disruptive, disruptive education, disruptive teaching, and so on. And I'd just like your, to hear what you have to say about how that kind of streamlines or doesn't with civility. Thank you. Well, uh, you know, I don't know exactly what you mean by disruptive education, but I think one of the uh, ways, that one of the things about disruptive education is, is kind of the idea of flipping the classroom. Um, you know, instead of standing up here and lecturing for a class, we put the lectures online and we use the class time when we're together to be more interactive and, you know, to work on experiments, to talk about, uh, talk about 
issues to get our hands, uh, hands dirtier with uh, different kinds of things. If disruptive also means dealing with controversial issues of, of the day, then again, I, I, you know, I am the son of an academic. I, I have been sort of at Hopkins for 30 years. I, I think that if we can't have these conversations here, then I don't know where else we can have them. I think that the college classroom is maybe one of the best places to try to have these difficult conversations. Um, and if that's disruptive, then <laughs> You know, it's part of part of the part of the work that we need to to do because life is all about having difficult conversations. So, anyway, thank, thank you all. You all. Uh, like, uh, we've got some uh, events this weekend. Who's going to announce those, Caitlin? Really quickly, events this weekend. All right, thanks a lot, Caitlin. Members of the Convocation Committee, just make yourselves known. Kelly Ansley, raise your hand real quickly. Uh, Joe Kennedy, Lisa Cassidy, Dr. Lee Cheek. Hold on, students. Uh, Jessica Palumbo, David Strickland, thanks for all your help. Thanks for being here. Thanks for being here, everybody. Have a good one. Thanks for coming out. Enjoy lunch.